We've probably all experienced those times when it seems like the day has passed by in a blink and other times where the day does seem to just go on and on and on. Hence that wonderful phrase, time is relative. Continuing on page 31, looking at theories of relativity, item number 10, what is space-time? This is an area of cosmology you could spend an entire life researching and trying to comprehend. We are going to distill it down. Remember, we're keeping everything as simplified as possible. And think of space-time in terms of a fourth dimension, a fourth dimension. Now, you and I are beings that operate in a three-dimensional world, and it's very difficult to try and comprehend something that we cannot physically see, and it's very difficult to try and describe what we mean by a fourth dimension. Our upcoming work with thinking about a fourth dimension will kind of be like this, an Escher-esque type illustration here where it's hard to try and visualize where's the up, where's the down, who is working upstairs, downstairs, upper floor, lower floor. It's very difficult to try and take in this image. And this is what it's like to try and process what is the fourth dimension. To begin our work with what is space-time, what do we mean by a fourth dimension? We're going to take the next seven or eight minutes and let Dr. Carl Sagan uh, do a wonderful job of demonstrating and explaining what is meant by fourth dimension, space-time, also known as curvature of space. In discussing the large-scale structure of the cosmos, Astronomers sometimes say that space is curved, or that the universe is uh, finite but unbounded. Whatever are they talking about? Let's imagine that we are perfectly flat. I mean absolutely flat, and that we live, appropriately enough, in a flat land. A land designed and named by Edwin Abbott, a Shakespearean scholar who lived in Victorian England. Everybody in Flatland is, of course, exceptionally flat. We have squares, circles, and triangles, and we all scurry about, and we can go into our houses and do our flat business. Now, we have width and length, but no height at all. Now, these little cutouts have some little height, but uh, let's ignore that. Let's imagine that these are absolutely flat. That being the case, we know, us flatlanders, about left-right, and we know about forward-back, but we have never heard of up-down. Let us imagine that into flatland, hovering above it, comes a strange three-dimensional creature which, oddly enough, looks like an apple. And the three-dimensional creature sees uh, an attractive, congenial-looking square, watches it enter its house and decides in a gesture of interdimensional amity to say hello. Hello, says the three-dimensional creature. How are you? I am a visitor from the third dimension. Well, the poor square looks around his closed house, sees no one there, and what's more, has witnessed a greeting coming from his insides, a voice from within. He surely is getting a little worried about his sanity. The three-dimensional creature is unhappy about being considered a psychological aberration, and so he descends to actually enter Flatland. Now, a three-dimensional creature exists in Flatland only partially. Only a plane, a cross-section through him can be seen. So. When the three-dimensional creature first reaches flatland, it's only the points of contact which can be seen. And we'll represent that by stamping the apple in this ink pad and placing that image in flatland. And as the apple were to descend through, slither by flatland, we would progressively see higher and higher slices, which we can represent by cutting. 
the apple. So the square, as time goes on, sees a set of objects mysteriously appear from nowhere and inside a closed room and change their shape dramatically. His only conclusion could be that he's gone bonkers. Well, the apple might be a little annoyed at this conclusion and so not such a friendly gesture from dimension to dimension, makes a contact with the square from below and sends our flat creature fluttering and spinning above flatland. At first, the square has no idea what's happening. He's terribly confused. This is utterly outside his experience. But after a while, he comes to realize that he is seeing inside closed rooms in flatland. He is looking inside his fellow flat creatures. He is seeing flatland from a perspective no one has ever seen it before to his knowledge. Getting into another dimension provides as an incidental benefit a kind of x-ray vision. Now our flat creature slowly descends to the surface and his friends rush up to see him. From their point of view, he has mysteriously appeared from nowhere. He hasn't walked from somewhere else. He's come from some other place. They say, for heaven's sake, what's happened to you? And the poor square has to say, well, I was in some other mystic dimension called up. And they will pat him on his side and comfort him, or else they'll ask, well, show us, where is that three dimen third dimension? Point to it and the poor square will be unable to comply. But maybe more interesting is the other direction in dimensionality. What about the fourth dimension? Now, to approach that, let's consider a cube. We can imagine a cube in the following way. You take a line segment and move it at right angles to itself an equal length. That makes a square. Move that square an equal length at right angles to itself, and you have a cube. Now, this cube, we understand, um, casts a shadow. And that shadow, we recognize. It's, you know, ordinarily drawn in uh, third grade classrooms as two squares with their vertices connected. Now, if we look at the shadow of a three-dimensional object in two dimensions, we see that, in this case, not all the lines appear equal. Not all the angles are right angles. The three-dimensional object has not been perfectly represented in its projection in two dimensions, but that's part of the cost of losing a dimension in the projection. Now, let's take this three-dimensional cube and project it, carry it, through a fourth physical dimension. Not that way, not that way, not that way, but at right angles to those three directions. I can't show you what direction that is, but imagine that there is a fourth physical dimension. In that case, we would generate a four-dimensional hypercube, which is also called a tesseract. I cannot show you a tesseract because I and you are trapped in three dimensions. But what I can show you is the shadow in three dimensions of a four-dimensional hypercube or tesseract. This is it. And you can see it's two nested cubes, all the vertices connected by lines. And now the real tesseract in four dimensions would have all the lines of equal length and all the angles right angles. That's not what we see here, but that's the penalty of projection. So you see, while we cannot imagine the world of four dimensions, we can certainly think about it perfectly well perfectly well. We want to label this, as Dr. Carl Sagan mentioned, this is a representation of a fourth dimensional hypercube, which we call a tesseract. A tesseract. T-E-S-S-E-R-A-C-T. -S -S -E tesseract. Now, of course, this isn't the actual fourth dimensional uh, represent, or fourth dimensional object. It's a representation as really all of those angles should be 90 degrees, which they aren't, and all of those lines should be equal length, which they are not.
And this is just the byproduct of living in a three dimensional world as human beings. And this is that shadow of a fourth dimensional hypercube. So you and I can think of a flat land and a cube land, a three dimensional land. In the beginning of that uh, clip from Cosmos, Sagan mentioned the book from which that demonstration was given called Flatland by Edwin Abbott. And a few years ago, Hollywood made a production of Flatland, not for major uh, movie theaters to be distributed, but more along the educational side of things. And it's an animation and called Flatland, A Journey of Many Dimensions. And we're going to show you the trailer for Flatland. Imagine a vast plain, a world of only two dimensions, on which triangles, squares, pentagons, and other figures live and move freely about. Configuration, Configuration makes, makes the man. man. Capulate, capulate. To your squarical! Now! You're only a square. Thanks, brother. They know nothing of our three dimensional world. Such a notion is, of course, absurd and furthermore, illegal. But that's all about to change. Where did you come from? I come from space, the third dimension. No, 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 you're not serious. Based on the beloved novel by Edwin A. Abbott. Tonight our world faces a grave threat. I can prove there is another dimension to space that is upward. That's so hard to imagine, but wouldn't that be amazing? My own infinite universe of zero dimensions. <laughs> Wonder. We're going to be truncated. Oh, not that angle. I came to reveal the truth of the third dimension. No more. Oh. Dude, you're freaking me out. What exactly is a dimension? Mathematics, reason, and imagination will help reveal the truth. Flatland, the movie. The third dimension is real. Hopefully you enjoyed the trailer, as we are actually going to watch the full feature of Flatland. However, we'll view this upon either my or your return to the classroom, as there is a copyright fee which has been paid, which allows me to show it in a classroom setting, and not to uh, incorporate this into a YouTube video, or a video that I give you a link to that I may would have embedded Flatland into. So I want to honor that copyright agreement, and we will resume to Flatland upon return to the classroom. Continuing on page 31, this question of how did Sir Isaac Newton view space and time? Now, of course, Newton is around in the 17th century, whereas Einstein is around in the 20th century. This is not to say that Newton, up here pictured in a clip art representation, it's not to say Newton disagrees with Einstein or Einstein disagreed with Newton. It was just the best understanding of space and time within the lifetime of the gentleman. I think if Newton had been alive in a time where he could have been familiar with the work of Einstein, that he would most certainly agree with the concepts put forth in the theories of relativity. And what a fascinating thought to think about Newton and Einstein collaborating, being research partners. So uh, the clip we're going to see next is not necessarily in the hope of having you understand how did Newton view space and time versus how Einstein viewed space and time in terms of being able to describe the differences, more so looking at the fact that Sir Isaac Newton viewed space and time as absolute. 
Shakespeare had written, of course, very famously that all the world's a stage, right? And that's really the kind of picture or metaphor that Newton has in mind throughout his greatest work, the Principia. The planets will move around, the comets will orbit the sun, the apples will fall, and all that happens, all that action takes place on a kind of perfectly rigid, unchanging stage. And that stage is then space and time for Newton. So Newton says very famously, space and time are each absolute. They flow without compromise. There's nothing that happens on that stage is going to affect the stage itself. Um, they're not actors in the drama. Newton's view of time is the, what I would call the everyday notion of time that we, uh, that we grow up with, that we become familiar with in our everyday lives. The notion that time is universal, it's the same for everyone, everywhere, no matter what they're doing, that it ticks away at a constant rate and time is passing equally and exactly the same for everyone, no matter what they're doing. And all, all of our everyday experience points to this being the correct notion of time. And we come to, to Einstein, and especially with his general theory of relativity, um, his theory of gravity, space and time, or their union into space-time, now has become an actor in the play. It's not sort of set off apart from the other things like the planets whizzing around or comets or apples. It's now part of that story, so that the other actors, say, uh, large uh, masses like the sun, can actually have an impact that can affect the shape of space, the flow of time in its vicinity, and vice versa. So they become part of the kind of stage play, not set off. So Newton had said time and space were, first of all, separate from each other, and were sort of absolute, apart, distinct. And Einstein starts folding them into the kind of larger drama. In Einstein's theory of gravity, time becomes personal. So the time that elapses for me is entirely personal to me. The time that elapses for anyone is entirely personal to them. And the way that time elapses, the way that time flows for an individual is completely dependent on where they are and what they're doing. So if all the world's a stage, then the structure of that stage is the structure of space-time, this entity that, that Einstein introduced. Item 12, what is the equivalence principle of the general theory of relativity? So there's special theory of relativity dealing with time, length, contraction, and we have the general theory of relativity, which deals with gravity, which I try and remember the difference between the two, special and general. G for general, G for gravity. We're going to have you jot down what the equivalence principle is, and then we're just going to fire at you three different video sections. And these three video sections are to give you three different ways of having the equivalence principle described to you. Sometimes it helps to hear the same concept, but presented by different people in different ways to have the concept sink in. So first of all, here is the concept of the equivalence principle. So the EP, equivalence principle, asserts, states, says, you cannot distinguish between being at rest in a gravitational field and being accelerated upward in a weightless environment. I'll give you time to jot that down, not necessarily time to process what it means just yet. The equivalence principle asserts you cannot distinguish, you can't tell the difference between being at rest in a gravitational field and being accelerated upward in a weightless environment. He imagines a man in a box floating weightlessly in a distant region of space in zero gravity. Suddenly, the man stops floating and accelerates downward until he's standing in the box. What has happened? Either the box is now close to a planet and the force of gravity has pulled the man to the floor, or someone has attached a rope and the box is now being pulled continuously and accelerated upwards. So which is it? Gravity or acceleration? Without being able to see outside, 
the man can't tell what's causing his fall to the floor. Einstein realized that there is no way to tell the difference between sitting in a gravitational field and being accelerated. And these are equivalent situations. The fact that these two effects are the same, give the same result, means that gravity is acceleration. It's not just like acceleration, it's the same thing. It's a big breakthrough. Einstein's theory of special relativity worked for motion at a constant speed. By extending his ideas to acceleration, he could begin to formulate a new theory of gravity. In 1907, just a couple of years after he does his theory of special relativity, Einstein's a little bit worried. Special relativity only applies to bodies in a constant state of motion. He's trying to figure out, how does that deal with acceleration? There's another problem that we had all inherited by then from Newton, which is that there's something called gravitational mass, how much something weighs in the gravitational field, and there's something called inertial mass, which is how much force does it take to push it and get it moving. And inertial mass and gravitational mass are the same, but they're two different ways of explaining them. And Einstein really hated when there was two theories explaining one phenomenon. He wanted to unify it. And so then he has what's called his happiest thought. He imagines a person just falling free-falling in space. And he says, well, that person wouldn't feel gravity as he accelerated downward. And likewise, he imagined somebody in an enclosed elevator who's being accelerated upward in outer space where there's no gravitational field. He said, well, that person would still feel like there's gravity. If he took something out of his pocket and dropped it, it would fall to the floor at an accelerated rate. There'd be pressure up on his feet, just as if he were standing in a stationary elevator car on the surface of the Earth. So he realizes what he calls the principle of equivalence, that the effects of gravity and the effects of acceleration are equivalent. So there must just be one explanation for gravity and acceleration. And that's what the general theory of relativity is. It takes the notion of constant velocity in motion, which is special relativity, and says, how are we going to apply it to accelerated motion. And he really comes up with this notion of a fabric of space and time, as if it's a fabric that sort of curves, like a trampoline fabric. You roll a bowling ball on it, and it curves, because the bowling ball's there. Then if you put some billiard balls going afterwards, they kind of move towards the bowling ball. Why? Not because the bowling ball has a particular attraction, but because it's curved, the fabric on which they're rolling. Now imagine that in the three dimensions of curving all three dimensions of space. Pretty hard, right? But also imagine it in four dimensions, because what gravity does, it's a curving of the three dimension of space plus time, the curving of space-time. Pretty difficult, but it all amounts to the most elegant theory in the history of science, the general theory of relativity. We take navigation for granted these days. GPS receivers guide airplanes, cars, and even cell phones. But did you know that the global positioning system is basically a big clock in space? There are 30 GPS satellites in orbit, and they just broadcast where they are and what time it is. All your phone GPS has to do is receive signals from four satellites, and it can triangulate its location in the four dimensions in which we live. Three space and one time. But actually, it's not that simple. In order for navigation to work, the satellites carry atomic clocks accurate to the nanosecond. Otherwise, your GPS receiver might tell you you're halfway across town when you're still in the driveway. And special relativity tells us that moving clocks run slow, while general relativity tells us that clocks run faster higher in a gravitational field. These effects don't quite cancel. General relativity wins out, and time indeed runs faster up in orbit with the satellites. But some of the engineers working on the first GPS satellite couldn't bring themselves to believe that their clock would actually run fast just from being higher up, so they sent it up uncorrected. Within minutes, it was off by enough to impair GPS navigation, and by the end of the day, GPS receivers would have been wrong by tens of kilometers. Needless to say, the engineers turned the correction back on, and these days, they trust general relativity. Oh, and one last thing. GPS is also a nuclear weapons detector. There are always at least four GPS satellites visible from any point on Earth, and because of this, any nuclear detonation will be seen by enough satellites to pinpoint exactly where and when it took place. <laughs>